Café Scientifique is a monthly series of expert-led discussions on science and culture presented by the Bell Museum of Natural History. For more information about the Bell Museum or to find out about upcoming Café Scientifique programs, visit bellmuseum.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Well, welcome everyone to Café Scientifique, um, sponsored by the Bell Museum of Natural History and Planetarium. I'm Don Luce. I'm curator of exhibits at the Bell Museum of Natural History. I know there are a lot of fans for Kevin William out there in the audience, and so I'm afraid that Kevin is not here. And I, as of about uh, two hours ago, I was uh, roped into doing uh, the Kevin warm-up role here. So have I covered everything? All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. I think you did an excellent job. Thank you, Don. Indeed, he will be our speaker next uh, for the next cafe, which is in December. And as you know, a lot of people are very curious about what the heck we're going to do with our dioramas, moving the Bell Museum. It's something that's rarely been attempted in the world, truly. And in fact, we, I think, anticipate still that people from museums all over the world might you know, take a great interest in the process as we're going through it. Um, so if you'd like to learn some more about that and the history of dioramas and why we still think they're important and how we're going to bring them into the future, please come and have a discussion with us at our next cafe, which is the third Tuesday of December, whatever that is. The 20th. Yes, the 20th. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here. My name is Leah Peterson, and I'm your host and the coordinator for adult programs at the Bell Museum. Thank you. <laughs> Um, this is a book written by our fabulous speaker tonight, Dr. John Pastor, who is, uh, in addition to many things, an author. Um, he has brought, at my invitation, copies of the book to sell tonight, because I know some of you, I think, are collecting books that have been written by our cafe speakers, and you could have quite a library going by now. John Pastor received his PhD in forestry and soil science in 1980 from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and did his postdoctoral research in the Environmental Sciences Division at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He has been a senior research associate at Natural Resources Research, research Institute since 1984, professor in biology since 1996, and director of graduate studies in biology since 2000. His research and scholarly interests include the structure and function of northern ecosystems, applications of mathematics to ecological problems, and scientific illustration, which is something that he and our curator Don Luce have in common, and one of the ways that you know each other, I believe, yeah. Um, he is uh, on a phased retirement and no longer taking new graduate students, but he's still advising people all the time, and thankfully he has time to come all the way down here from Duluth, spend some time with his family, and do a Cafe Scientifique for us while he's here. So without further ado, I'd love to bring John Pastor to the stage. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks, Leah, for the introduction, and, and Don uh, for inviting me down here. Um, <clears throat> we came down a little bit early today, and Don was kind enough to show me some of the plans for the new museum, and I got to see the the secret, you know, these cardboard things that architects make, models of the buildings. I got to see the secret model. It's really going to be cool. Um, it, unfortunately, it's not open until... To spring of 2018, so we have to go a while uh, without a bell museum, an active bell museum. But things are going to be moved, and uh, Don will talk about it next next month. But it's going to be a very very cool uh, museum, and I like the old bell museum. I very fond of it. I was kind of sad to hear that it was going to move, but after seeing the model today, I'm really excited about the uh, the move. <laughs> Mm. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, um, uh, I'm not going to talk about what should a clever moose eat, this, <laughs> this, but this is not a bait and switch. Uh, Leah liked this title of my book, and the reason why the title is there, when I started writing this book, it's a book of essays about the North Woods, the natural history 
ecology and and uh, in the North Woods. Um, the publisher and I, my editor, were going back and forth about titles, and she didn't like any of the titles I was suggesting. And finally, I thought um, authors often use this title for their book, particularly books of essays, the title of one of the essays. And so I was looking through the essays, and I said, well, here's one called What Should a Clever Moose Eat, which is an essay in the book. She said, well, that's great, and that's what we'll use. And it turns out women like this title and more than men do, I think, is the <laughs> informal survey. My wife likes it a lot, um, who's sitting in the, in the back there. <clears throat> um, but one of the marketing people at Island Press said, well, that's not going to work because people think it's a children's book. And they were overruled. And sure enough, a couple of bookstores said, well, we don't carry children's books, so we won't order that book. <laughs> so they had to be explained that, no, it's not a children's book. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is, and I'm going to do a combination of um, slides. Uh, I illustrated the book with uh, pen and ink drawings. The uh, painting of the birch trees on the front is my painting. And uh, the illustrations are going to be largely my drawings and paintings with some few data slides, uh, some photographs, things like that. And I'm going to do a combination talking about, so I'm not going to talk about the title of the book. I'm going to talk about the subtitle of the book, Natural History, Ecology, in the North Woods. And the reason is that um, I think even though I teach and, and enjoy doing, applying mathematics to ecology, sometimes that gets really abstract. And really the basis of ecology is natural history. So every question that we um, deal with in really all of biology, but especially ecology, comes from an observation of, uh, that we make out, out in nature. For example, I've worked about 20, 25 years on trying to answer the question, what should a clever moose eat? And we think we have a fair idea of it. Um, we're still not sure. Um, but it all came out of watching what a moose does, and the moose will stop at a spot and it'll eat aspen, and it will not eat the black spruce that's right next to the aspen, or the balsam fir that's next to the aspen. And so we asked ourselves, why is that, and what are the consequences of that? And that's a pure natural history question, but it led to 25 years of research and the development of actually some cool stuff. Like Ron Moe and my graduate student and I, we were one of the first people, we are the first people in the United States and the second team of people in North America by only a week to put GPS collars on large animals. And GPS collars have now become the standard replacement for radio collars. But that was one of the outcomes of trying to answer this question of what should a moose eat? Because we had to figure out where should a moose travel through the woods? And one time I, I told my sister, she asked me what I was working on, and I said, well, we're trying to figure out how a moose moves through the woods, and she's not a biologist, and she said, any way it wants to, why should you care? <laughs> so in the preface to the book, I said, you know, she actually has a good, made a good point. Why should we care about that? And the point of this book is to tell people why we should care about these kinds of questions, because this is the basis of all of what we do in conservation and management and everything else, it all comes out of natural history. And I'll have more to say about this uh, towards the end and uh, why it's important. So, let's see. Let's start with, what do I mean by the North Woods? Well, it's largely defined by the plants, uh, but also some of the animals in it. So, the plants range from things like, and this is one of my uh, paintings here, uh, conifers such as um, balsam fir and spruce. Uh, here's a picture of a grove of spruce that's done on this is an interesting technique. You take a piece of rice paper and crinkle it up and then unfold it and smooth it out and then you paint on that. And you get this sort of uh, twiggy effect. It's, so I'm starting to do more with that. It's, a, it's actually an old Japanese uh, Chinese painting uh, technique, crinkled rice paper. Um, birches, uh, here's one I did this summer of uh, 
uh, paper birches, um, pines such as white pine, uh, jack pine, which has these uh, <clears throat> uh, cones that remain closed like over here on the branch, curled up until a fire comes along and has to burn the resin that opens the cones up, and that's what spreads the seeds, and that's what allows the forest to recover after fire. So jack pine keeps colonizing an area by these adaptations to fire. Um, <clears throat> this is a, uh, a color sketch I did of uh, just the fall colors around uh, in Bagley Nature Area, around Bagley Pond, uh, Rock Pond, on our campus at the University of Minnesota Duluth. This is our teaching forest that we use. About 50 acres of largely old growth uh, forest. Uh, but here's where we get the nice reds of the uh, maples and, and oranges and maples in the winter or in the fall and the uh, yellows and the, the dark uh, brownish reds of the red oaks and the yellows of the, uh, the birches and aspen. <clears throat> and it's also a forest with abundant fruit. Uh, everybody's favorite, of course, uh, blueberries. Uh, here's an illustration of blueberries from the book. There's an essay on blueberries in the book. <clears throat> uh, Juneberries, which in the spring produce these beautiful white flowers. Uh, and Juneberries look and taste kind of like blueberries, and they're all over the place on the side of the road in the, the north woods. But the flowers are just these gorgeous snow white flowers in the spring. And blooming at the same time are wild plums, uh, which are great attractants for pollinators such as uh, honeybees. The, my wife and I have a couple of hives of honeybees, and we have wild plums around our yard, and the bees are just on them at night all the time. You could stand under the, the uh, canopy of the wild plum. They're kind of like a tall shrub, maybe about this high, and the place is just buzzing with bees, and the bees are just so happy gathering nectar, they're not going to sting you or anything. So it's fun just to s stand under there, and there could be two, 300 bees just right above your head like this. And you just hear them buzzing, and they're happy, and everything else. But it's an important um, nectar plant for bees in the spring. So <clears throat> more specifically, how do we define the North Woods as an ecosystem? And I like to think of it as the place in North America where the range of sugar maple here from the northern edge of the Great Lakes south um, overlaps with the range of balsam fir, which is from sort of the middle of the Great Lakes going north. So kind of this area from western Minnesota here through the Arrowhead, east all the way to the no Nova Scotia and Newfoundland and the Maritime Provinces. And what this map doesn't show is uh, too easily, you can't see it, but there are spots of balsam fir that go down the crest of the Appalachians. So there's kind of a spine of north woods that comes down the crest of the Appalachians here. And I like to think of it as it's the land of um, maple syrup and Christmas trees. So if you think of the kind of forest where you get maple syrup and Christmas trees, this is the north woods. <clears throat> now you might think, well, it's, it's really a transitional forest between the eastern hardwoods and the boreal forest, true boreal forest, uh, to the north. But it's actually a very, very large biome. It, it encompasses about 20 million square kilometers. The length of it from Minnesota to um, Nova Scotia over here in the Maritime Provinces is the same as the length of the Amazon Basin. So this, this is huge. This is a huge forest in and of itself. And I don't think of it as a transition forest. It's just another kind of forest. Um, it's really a, a very unique forest. There's very few places on Earth that have this combination of uh, conifers and deciduous hardwood trees that kind of look like the North Woods. There's an elevation in the Alps in France that has a lot of birch, which is kind of like the North Woods. Uh, the northernmost island in Japan, Hokkaido, has a kind of forest that's like the North Woods. And then in northeastern China, particularly on a, uh, an extinct volcano there, Chiang Bai Shan, which I was fortunate to visit back in the 1980s, um, that has a kind of forest that looks like the North Woods. But really, there's no other place on Earth that has a forest that's like this. 
and maybe a little bit in Scandinavia, but when my Scandinavian colleagues come over here to, who I work with, they look at our forests and they say, you know, it's like our forest, but the, particularly in the fall, Scandinavia doesn't have the fall colors that we have over here. So we're really lucky in Minnesota to be living in the, uh, the western edge of the, uh, the North Woods and have quite a big chunk of it. And actually, in the boundary waters in the Quetico north of that, the largest wilderness area in the North Woods, uh, contiguous wilderness area in the North Woods, well over a million acres of, uh, of land that's original forest from the, the North Woods. Uh, <clears throat> With a, this combination of conifers and uh, deciduous trees, there's actually a fair diversity of tree species here. And what that does is it supports a really high diversity of bird species. Uh, this is the uh, breeding bird survey map of uh, the average number of breeding birds per 25 mile survey route, I think is what it is. And you can see the highest diversity here, somewhere around 30 to 100, is centered right on that band where sugar maple and balsam fir overlap, the North Woods, right here um, spanning the, the Great Lakes and the upper uh, shore, the northern shore of the Great Lakes here. That diversity actually declines as you go south, and we don't get a similar diversity until you get down into Costa Rica and the Central American tropics. So the bird species diversity of the North Woods is actually extremely high, higher than most other temperate forest places on Earth. Um, <clears throat> one of those species, one of my favorites, is the uh, chestnut-sided warbler. And the warblers themselves, there are 40 warblers in North America, 40 warbler species in North America. 30 of them breed in the North Woods. So we have three quarters of all the breeding warbler species in North America, in the North Woods, and, and that nest in northern Minnesota. Uh, this is the chestnut-sided warbler. Um, this is a really nice one. I, it's too bad it's in black and white. Um, but it's got a yellow cap here and a rust-colored band on the, uh, the side of its uh, breast here and dark all the way back. It nests it likes sugar maples. Uh, particularly uh, young sugar maples nest in kind of brushy stands. But if you look at the range map for chestnut sided warbler, it is essentially exactly the boundary of the North Woods. So this, this bird is, to me, the characteristic bird of the North Woods. Warblers are also important because they're important predators on insects like um, spruce budworm, uh, tent caterpillar, the, the army worms that we have up there. And uh, that diversity of warblers uh, plays a very important role in, uh, in maintaining the stability of the North Woods and keeping the, uh, the insect pests from getting too much out of control in most years. OK, and so now I'm going to start with some readings from the book. And what I want to start with is, um, speaking of birds, take a bird's eye view of uh, the North Woods. So if we flew over the North Woods, what would we see? If you fly from Minneapolis or Chicago to Northern Europe, get a window seat on the north left side of the plane. Ecologists and geologists should always ask for window seats. Watch the landscape of Northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ontario, Maine, and Labrador pass by instead of watching the movie. Trust me, the landscape is better. In many places and for many hours, you will see more water than land. Rivers, sometimes braided, meander across the landscape. The lakes will be in every conceivable size, from small ponds to large inland seas like the Great Lakes, and in every shape, from almost perfectly round holes that look like kitchen kettles, remember the question, to worm-like lakes with long axes aligned north-south. The lakes are the eyes of the landscape. The sun flickers off their surfaces. Picture yourself down there traveling through it. In summer, it is easier to canoe through most of the northern landscape than to walk across it. In winter, the frozen and snow-blanketed lakes and rivers are level and open highways for travel by snowshoes, skis, and dog sled. So the abundance of water in all of its forms in this landscape 
is what defines the distribution of tree species in the landscape and the character of the North Woods. This is a place where the, the desert is the absence of water, the North Woods is where there's plenty of water and still be land. So what are the origins of this? This goes back to the, uh, the ice sheet that covered northern Minnesota to a depth of, of mile and a half, maybe two miles deep in far northern Minnesota during the height of the glaciation about um, 18,000 years ago and then started retreating. Glacier Act it was actually down here too. Um, this is the snout of a glacier that, not the actual ice sheet itself, but um, when I was doing research in Antarctica, this is the Hughes Glacier uh, that I took a photograph of and drew this, this drawing from. These boulders down here are the size of a small cottage to give you some estimate of scale. So this is not a mile and a half thick, but it's many, many thousands of feet thick, several thousands of feet thick. Well, what the glacier left behind is a lot of rocks on the shores of the lakes that bung up our canoes when we uh, come to shore. Um, it also created cliffs um, and uh, along stream banks and stuff. This is a, one of my more abstract paintings I've done. What this has done is on a sh sheet of watercolor paper that I cover with acrylic gel mat, which is a water resistant surface. And then after that dries, then I blotch watercolor on it. And then I put saran wrap down on top of it. And the paint is caught between two water repellent surfaces. And it just moves in very strange directions. And it's really fun to do. But what it leaves you after, you, after it dries, you peel the saran wrap off, are these rock-like textures of the cliffs of uh, northern Minnesota, particularly the lakes, if you're in the boundary waters, you can go past these cliffs. These are the cliffs that the Indians did paintings on. Um, and I don't know, I'm just experimenting with this kind of painting. These are, so you can see my artwork ranges from really realistic to really abstract. <clears throat> it also left behind the glacier um, various kinds of uh, soils, from very sandy soils, uh, like this one over here, you can see all the sand and uh, glacial outwash to very clay rich soils on the moraines and drumlins and, and uh, even to some extent eskers. And so the water holding capacity of these to two soils is, is extremely different. And that causes tree species to segregate across the landscape. So on the sandy soils, that's where we find the more drought resistant pines, particularly the jack pine, uh, red oaks. And on the clay rich soils that can hold a lot of water, that's where we find the maples and basswoods and birches. And this will become important in several times throughout the talk here. That's going to be very important for the future of the North Woods under a uh, warmer climate. <clears throat> it's, it also created these kettle lakes where there was a block of ice that became detached from the, uh, the main body of the ice sheet. Uh, till and outwash was draped over it. And so this block of ice slowly melted and as it melted, the uh, blanket of till or outwash sagged into the, uh, into the melting ice until it intersected the groundwater level, and now you have lakes. And these lakes are generally round. Most of the 14,000 lakes in Minnesota are kettle lakes that were formed this way. This one actually is, um, if you go up to Duluth off of Highway 23, there's a classic just north of Nickerson. Uh, there's a classic kettle lake there. In fact, there's a whole bunch of kettle lakes there. And this is a little watercolor sketch I did one day uh, driving past it. But these kettle lakes are important because they hold fish that we like to fish for, uh, walleye, trout, um, so forth. But they're also important scientifically because they collected the pollen. And this pollen, over the years, that builds up in the sediment of these lakes is the record of the history of the North Woods, in fact, forests anywhere. The University of Minnesota, back in the 1970s and 80s, was a real powerhouse of this kind of work on using pollen from these cores to um, reconstruct the history of forests uh, throughout Eastern North America. And so we had people here like Margaret Davis and Ed Cushing and uh, Evel Gorham and a whole bunch of people that were doing this kind of work. Uh, when they retired, the ecology department didn't replace them. And in fact, palynology 
sort of went into a slump for a while. Now it's coming back as we're becoming more interested in trying to figure out how forests are going to respond to, uh, uh, to future climate change. But these are pollen grains. And this one here is a, uh, this is a typical of most conifer pollen grains. Let me start there. What these three things here are on these, these little bags are actually air-filled bladders that help the pollen uh, waft away in the, uh, in the wind. Uh, this one is a uh, uh, maple pollen, and this one is a birch pollen. And so the pollen that's in the, in the sediment has been building up layer by layer over the years. If you take a core through the sediment, you could date different layers in the sediment by carbon-14 carbon and various other means and get a time record of what the forests look like at various times. So here's a little, um, some data. This is what palynologists did for a long time, was just compile these pollen records. So this is the surface of the, uh, of the sediment. And going down, you, go, you get older and older in, in time till you get about 10,000 or eight to 10,000 years. Uh, when the lake started to form right after the glacier left. And the size of these different things show the ab relative abundance of pollen from different species. So this one on both of these is jack pine. This is white pine. This is uh, spruces all over here. This is the birches over here, oaks, maples, and so forth. And this is work done by uh, Linda Brubaker, who is a graduate student of Margaret Davis's here. And she looked at a lake in uh, no the northern UP, the UP of northern Michigan, that is on a clay till that could hold a lot of water, and another nearby lake that was off on the Sandy Owash Plain. And she said, did these two different kinds of soil types determine what kind of forest developed over time? And they did. So if you look at the, um, <clears throat> the Sandy Owash Plain, there's an abundance of this jack pine, which is very drought tolerant somewhat less so on the clay uh, that can hold a lot of water. But about 6,000 years ago, 8,000 8, years ago, it started to get warm. And we entered into what's called the hypsothermal, which is the warmest it's been since the current day. We are now warmer than hypsothermal. But jack pine declined. Um, white black spruce started coming in, and then, or white pine started coming in. Black spruce also declined to near nothing. I mean, black spruce had migrated further north than here and had migrated out of the, uh, the Great Lakes area, essentially, during this hypsothermal. White pine came in, and then it started to get cool again, and white pine declined a little bit. Birch came in, and the spruce came back in. <clears throat> so ever since the glacier left, there's been a whole series of forests that have gone back and forth as these species have entered the, air, entered the region and left the region. Uh, over time. <clears throat> and when the palynologists have compiled all this, what they could do, and this is Margaret Davis's work that she did here at the university, they can show migration pathways of different species as the glacier migrated back. So what these lines are is where the northern edge of sugar maple and white pine were at different times in the past. So what's interesting is, right now, sugar maple and white pine, they, they live together in northern Minnesota. 12 to 14,000 years ago, they didn't live together at all. So sugar maple was down here largely in the south. And 12 to 14,000 years ago, maybe getting as far north as Carolina, North Carolina, white pine was this sort of confined to this area of North Carolina, Virginia, and Delaware just north of sugar maple. So sugar maple was down here, and white pine was up here. And then as the climate warmed, sugar maple pretty much just moved in a straight front, straight north. White pine started moving up the eastern seaboard, and then about 10,000 years ago, made a right angle turn and came through the Great Lakes. And they both arrived in Minnesota here about 7,000 years ago. So these species came. The North Woods wasn't an intact biome sitting just south of the glacier and just sort of followed the glacier north. It became assembled as different species arrived here at different times and from different directions and at different rates. So the North Woods is only about 6,000 years old, which is only as old as 
civilization, the pyramids, you know, the oldest pyramids. It's probably one of the youngest biomes on Earth. The tundra was intact just in front of the glacier, and the tundra migrated northward, but the north woods didn't exist until about 6,000 years ago. So that's kind of a cool thing about the north woods that was discovered here in, at the University of Minnesota. Um, well, with, as the, the trees became, the tree species assembled themselves into this particular kind of community, then the herbivores followed, and the most important herbivore is the beaver. <clears throat> and this is off the, uh, the Spear hiking trail. Uh, it's, a, it's the place where my wife and I had our first date 15 years ago this year. And we got married one year later on that date. And this is the um, uh, looking down from the uh, cliff down on all series of beaver ponds. You can see there's a dam here, a dam here. Here's a really nice dam right here. Here's a dam right over in this direction. And so the beaver have terraced uh, this valley. Um, all up and down. And years, uh, years ago, I was working a lot on beaver ecology in Voyagers National Park. And one of the things we found by mapping beaver dams all over the park was that 90% of the water in Voyagers National Park, and we later determined also the boundary waters, flows through at least one, at least two beaver dams and 95% of the water flowing into lakes flows through at least one beaver pond. And those beaver ponds change the chemistry of the water. They really control the hydrology of what's going on. So the glacier sort of set the, uh, the, the table, so to speak, and created the table for the north woods to assemble itself. But the beaver are what's controlling the hydrology here. So where do beaver decide where to build a dam? It takes a lot of energy to build a dam. You see the, the length of these things here. <clears throat> and one of the things we found was that beaver preferred to build dams in places where a stream flows through a constricting gap in bedrock ridges, or more usually in the end rain sweeping across the landscape. Usually the dam plugging the gap floods a broad, shallow basin upstream that was hollowed out by the ice sheet. So the ice sheet hollowed out these basins, but the dam plugged it up and created the pond. A beaver is attracted to these gaps because of the gurgling sound of water flowing through them. Beaver therefore appear to search for particular basin geometries suited to establishing their ponds. In a sense, the beaver hears the geometry of the basin in the music of the bubbling stream. Within several decades, generations of beaver residing in an area will completely terrace the valleys with ponds and wet meadows. Each pond or meadow rising above the previous one in steps determined by the height of its dam. So you can see that right here. You step up and there's another pond, you step up and here's another pond here. One of my wife's uncles was fond of saying that life is like a beaver colony, one damn thing after another. <laughs> <clears throat> Taken together, ponds and meadows form a giant stairway snaking up the valley. Beaver ponds are in many ways the organizing force of the hydrology of these valleys. Well, in working in beaver dams and beaver ponds for a long time, I've become a real connoisseur of beaver dams. This is one of the, uh, on the ponds that we worked at at Voyagers National Park. And I should have had someone in here for scale, but the height of this here, from here to here, is about eight feet. This is a huge dam. And one of the neat things is that the beaver dams they're not really a random pile of sticks. The, the base, if you get to see a beaver dam when it's first, a beaver where it's first starting to build the dam, what it will do is it will bring sticks in with branches off it and lay the, the sticks down on the stream uh, parallel to stream flow. So the long axis of the stick is pointing along the flow of the stream with the branches pointing upstream. And those branches start trapping sediment. And that forms a really firm base for the building of the dam. And then the face of the dam, they uh, use these very long sticks. They drag these long sticks uh, here, and they, they put them so they're going vertical downward. So the water, when it flows over the dam, doesn't get caught in these sticks and washes them away. It just flows fairly smoothly over the dam itself. 
Well, beaver dams are another source of abstract art to me. And uh, here's a little sketch I did of beaver dam in, uh, in a field, field sketchbook. Uh, here's another one, a uh, painting that's on, on my office wall. Um, tried to capture the, you don't see it too well with the, the light here, but the flow of water across the dam and so forth. <clears throat> well, the beaver brought um, Europeans to this part of uh, North America in the 1600s. We were here, or Europeans were here, particularly the, the uh, fur traders were here, Hudson Bay and Norwest Company, trapping and trading in beaver uh, before the pilgrims arrived in Massachusetts. So it's, it's fun when you go out east, people say, oh, you know, you're from Minnesota, that's a new state and everything else. Like, well, actually, we were here before you were here. Uh, <clears throat> So if you have friends from Massachusetts, remind them of that. Um, but one of my favorite uh, people of the fur trade, uh, the fur trade and the French and Indian Wars is a period of history that really just fascinates me. I don't, I don't know why, but it just, it just does. And um, it's kind of a forgotten period of a lot of history, and maybe that's why it fascinates me. But one of the people that I really, really, he's one of my heroes, is David Thompson. How many people have heard of David Thompson? Have you heard of him? David Thompson <clears throat> was <clears throat> um, a trader. Started out with Hudson Bay Company and then switched to Norwest Company. And I'll get to that why he did that in a minute. <clears throat> and but what he did was he kept a journal. <coughs> pardon me, of his whole career in the North Woods. And only 500 of these journals were published when, at the end of his life, he finally finished it. And the library at the University of on my campus in Duluth, we have two of them. And they used to let you check these things out. And I would love to check these things out and go to places in the Boundary Waters and Voyagers where I knew Thompson went and just sit there in these beaver ponds and reading his journal thinking, wow, he wrote this while he was here. And now I'm here reading this. Um, but in these journals is just a huge uh, treasure trove of natural history and a lot of open questions that I think um, could be the subject of uh, students' theses today, master's and PhD theses. So I mentioned that David Thompson, um, and here's a, here's a picture of him. He was also trained as a surveyor in, uh, in England, and that's why Hudson Bay brought him over here and why the Northwest Company uh, grabbed them. Um, here's his notebooks that he later then transcribed uh, in his handwriting. These are in uh, the University of, in uh, Toronto, and they've now been republished in uh, uh, a series of uh, books published jointly by Champlain uh, Society Press, University of Washington Press, and I think University of Montreal Press. They all came together to publish these things. Um, the other thing Thompson did was he kept going beyond the Northwoods up the Athabasca River and into the Canadian Rockies and eventually found the headwaters of the Columbia River and also one of the other rivers, the Fraser River, that flows down through British Columbia. The headwaters of those two are just a few miles from each other. And then he canoed down the Columbia River to the sea. And this was only three miles after, or three years after Lewis and Clark discovered the Columbia River as the entrance to the, uh, the basically the, the northwest inland northwest passage across the continent. But David Thompson was the one that mapped the Columbia River and did extraordinary maps of the whole Northwoods and Northern Canadian uh, boreal forest and, and the Arctic. Many of these maps are accurate um, even today. Um, so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about David Thompson and uh, it'll give you a, an idea of how the, uh, the Hudson Bay Company and Norwest Company worked. And a reading of one of my readings of one of his uh, natural history observations. So on May 21st, 1797, David Thompson quit the Hudson Bay Company and began walking 130 kilometers, that's 80 miles, to Norwest Company's trading post at Reindeer, Reindeer Lake in northern Manitoba. He just said, I quit started walking 80 miles. Upon arrival, he immediately, he didn't hang around, 
he immediately embarked on a 1,600-kilometer inland voyage in a six-meter-long birch bark canoe with a brigade of Hivernauts, French voyagers from the Loire Valley. Um, his route took him southeast down the chain of Kettle Lakes. There's the Kettle Lakes again. Inside the terminal moraine to Lake Winnipeg, up the Winnipeg River to Lake of the Woods, then up the Rainy River to Rainy Lake. From here, he proceeded east through the north woods of present-day Minnesota and Ontario, the Quetico Superior, across uh, numerous lakes carved by the ice sheet. On July 22nd, Thompson, the Huguenots, and the cargo of furs arrived at the western edge of Grand Portage at the head of the Pigeon River flowing into Lake Superior. Very few people make that trip today, if anybody. So why did he quit the Norwest Company and go work for the Nor uh, Norwest Company? Well, the Hudson Bay Company and Norwest Company had different business models of fur trading, and the Norwesterners' philosophy suited Thompson much better. The Hudson Bay Company was content mainly to establish posts around the shores of Hudson Bay and let the Indian trappers come to them with the furs. The Hudson Bay Company did not hire the voyageurs. They had no interest whatsoever in exploring the boreal forest searching westward. Joseph Robson, a surveyor hired by Hudson's Bay Company, wrote, the company have for 80 years slept at the shores of a frozen sea. They have shown no curiosity to penetrate further themselves and have exerted all their art and power to crush that spirit in others. Thompson discovered within himself a boundless curiosity in nature and Native Americans after arriving at Hudson's Bay Post in Churchill. In, in 1784. During his employment, he was warned several times by the Hudson Bay Company governors to end this exploration nonsense and stick to making money for them, I might add. And apparently in 1797, he felt the spirit crushed enough to switch allegiances to the Hudson Bay Company rivals, the Northwest Company. The Northwest Company, in contrast, welcomed Thompson's skills in surveying and natural history. Montreal, which is where their headquarters is, is 1,600 kilometers further away from the land of prime beaver pelts than Hudson Bay Company. So look on a map and look where Hudson, the western shore of Hudson Bay is and look where Montreal is. Montreal is way further east than the Hudson Bay. To compete with the Hudson Bay Company, the Northwesterners had to employ voyageurs to skirt around the southern and western flanks of the Hudson Bay Company empire. That's why they came up the Great Lakes and through northern Minnesota, what we now have as the Boundary Waters. The lakes, both great and small, uh, formed a wilderness highway from Montreal to the Arctic over which the canoes and their cargo could be conveyed. The Norwest Company needed someone who could survey this route and make accurate maps and observations of the natural history and native customs of this vast land. Thompson was more than willing to oblige. So Thompson, like I said, these journals are just full of natural history observations. Um, and he was quite a character. He had with him in his canoe a microscope, an early microscope from the late 1700s, but a microscope nonetheless. And so he's going through using with, in his canoe through the wilderness, looking at things through a microscope in the 1780s, 1790s. <clears throat> um, and here's a, one of the things he did observe was how a mosquito bites you. What happens when a mosquito bites you? And he let a mosquito bite him and somehow got his finger under the microscope and was watching the mosquito draw blood from his finger through the microscope. In 1780, in a canoe in the North Woods, so here's what he wrote. The mosquito bill, by you know, the proboscis, when viewed through a good microscope, is of a curious formation, composed of two distinct pieces. The upper is three-sided of a black color and sharp pointed, under which is a round white tube like clear glass, the mouth inverted inwards. With the upper part, the skin is perforated. It is then drawn back in the clear tube applied to the wound and the blood sucked through it into the body till it is full. Thus their bite are two distinct operations, 
but so quickly done as to feel only one. So next time you get a mosquito bite, think about that, what the mosquito is doing. My favorite, one of his observations, and this is a really, really cool one. You know, a lot of, like I mentioned before, a lot of my work has been on moose, research has been on moose. But one of the unsolved mysteries of Thompson's journal is the identity and existence of what the Chippewaian Indians called the Mate Moosewak, which means the ugly moose. Thompson notes, it is found only on a small extent of country, mostly around the Hatchet Lake, which is in northern Manitoba. This deer seems to be a link between the moose and the reindeer, which we call caribou now. It is about twice the weight of the latter, so about twice the size of a caribou, and has the habits of the former, of the moose. Its horns are palmated somewhat like those of a moose, and its color is much the same. It feeds on buds and the tender branches of willows and aspen, and also on moss. That's interesting because reindeer feed on, on moss, the caribou, but moose do not. So this, this is a strange animal. In all my wanderings, Thompson said, I have seen only two alive. So what I think this is, is probably an extinct subspecies of moose that Thompson may have witnessed the last couple of these, these moose that were still alive in the late 1700s. But nobody has seen an animal like this since. An animal that was a, a small, somewhat smaller moose, kind of like almost a hybrid between a caribou and a moose. But moose and caribou don't hybridize today. So there's something very strange here. And it would be really interesting to see if anybody could find bones of this, these animals up around in the Hatchet Lake area, if there are any left or, or uh, antlers to have not decomposed and just see what it is. But it was probably a, um, the, after the moose came here, they radiated into seven subspecies. There's only one species left, Alces alces. Uh, or no, there's six, there's, there are about seven left. And this may have been one of the subspecies that, the, uh, uh, that went extinct and Thompson saw the last of. So as I mentioned, Thompson continued up the Athabasca River to the Rockies and then over the divide, continental divide, um, into the Columbia River and down the Columbia to the uh, Pacific Ocean. So to this essay, I wrote this postscript. <clears throat> as I write this, the tar sands along the Athabasca River are being mined, spewing toxic pollution into the river in which David Thompson's canoe floated while he wrote about the beauty of this land. Oil and gasoline will be refined from these tar sands. When they are burned, carbon dioxide will be emitted into the atmosphere where it will trap heat and alter the climate that was responsible for the assembly of the North Woods through which Thompson traveled. So that brings me to the future. And that's climate change, something our president-elect doesn't believe in. And the vice president doesn't either. The vice president thinks the earth is only about 10,000 years old. These are facts. This is not political commentary. These are just facts that you should know. Um, you're probably all familiar with this, but it's always worth seeing this again. This is the rise in carbon dioxide since the 1880s. We know that from cores taken from ice sheets in which little bubbles are trapped in annual layers of the ice. You could crush them in a vacuum, get out the air in those, and that was the air that was back in 1880 and so forth. We actually have a record of this going back two or 300,000 years now through cores through the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. The carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now is higher than it's ever been in the last two or 300,000 years. It's been rising since 1880, actually since really 1850, uh, because of burning of fossil fuels. That's what fueled the Industrial Revolution, it, starting in England. And uh, fossil fuel, actually, the amount of energy you get per, unit, for, per gram of fuel is very high. And particularly if you do this in an internal combustion engine, it's a very efficient way of moving mass. It's much more efficient than steam engines in which all the combustion was outside 
and was with wood. So that's why we switched very quickly from steam engines to in internal combustion engines driven by fossil fuels. Unfortunately, when we did this, uh, we didn't really know the consequences of this. Actually, actually, we did. There was a Swedish chemist, Arrhenius, who in the 1880s, by then, the chemists knew that carbon dioxide trapped heat. And Ar Arrhenius said, with the doubling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the temperature of the Earth will rise by some two to three degrees centigrade, which is a conservative estimate. Unfortunately, Arrhenius thought that this would take several thousand years for that to happen. It's happened in essentially in 150 years. Uh, with the rise in carbon dioxide, there's been a rise in heat. And the red is where it's the, the standard here is the, um, uh, the 1950s, I think. Somewhere around the 1950s is what's taken, the average temperature in that time is taken as normal uh, by meteorologists. So anything blue, it's colder than normal. Anything warm, it's warmer than normal and it's continued to rise. In 2016 will be the warmest year on record, breaking 2015, which was the warmest year on record, breaking 2014, breaking 2013. And we have never had four warmest years on record follow one right after another. This has never happened in 300,000 years. That's why it's a record. So when people say it's been warm in the past, this has happened in the past, no, it hasn't. It has never happened. Okay? These are, I don't know if you can see this very well, observed changes in surface temperature from 1901 to 2012. And the really purple areas here and up in here, this is where the greatest change in temperature has already happened. This is not model runs. So in northern regions here, we're in the north woods right on the edge of this in Siberia, We've already warmed two and a half degrees um, Fahrenheit since 1901. <clears throat> uh, we've also, in this area, had a great drought. Uh, people focus on the droughts in the West. The darker the color, the more intense the drought. And this is why all these fires are burning out there, the Yellowstone fire and so forth. But in the North Woods right here uh, in Minnesota, Wisconsin, UP, we've actually had a pretty good drought between 1987 and 2013. So it's, gonna get, it's getting warmer, it's getting drier, and remember those soils I showed that the glacier left? The sandy soils aren't gonna hold a lot of water, but the clay soils will hold a fair amount of water. Those soils are going to moderate how the North Woods responds to global warming. So <clears throat> when I was at Oak Ridge, a bunch of us became interested in this well, what we did was we constructed a model of how trees respond to things like temperature and drought days and shading of each other and growth curves. And a lot of the data for this comes from two sources. One, the Forest Service has compiled all that it knows and all that its foresters have gathered about the natural history of trees in eastern North America. And there's a similar one for uh, western North America. On, uh, in two handbooks called the Sovix handbooks. And these books gave us the data for this model. So what this model does is it kind of codifies the natural history of tree species in the North Woods. So we make, can make projections of how those trees might respond to warming on different kinds of soils. Another source that we found that was important is uh, Donald Colross Piatti's A Natural History of Trees of Eastern and and Central North America. If you, if you don't have this book, get it. You could get this on Amazon, or I've seen it at Majors and Quinn, places like that, various uh, bookstores in town. The, this is, these have been updated, and the Forest Service, you could order these from the uh, government printing office. Just go on, online to get it. <clears throat> so what we did was we started to simulate what might happen to the forests of eastern North America in about 50 locations in eastern North America on both, uh, if the soil is a very silty clay rich soil that can hold a lot of water and a sandy soil that can't. So what we did, and this is using climate of Cloquet, Minnesota, just on the edge of the North Woods. We started the model with bare ground, ran it for 200 years under the current climate 
started warming it and drying it down by about 20% over 100 years and 200 more years under the warmer, drier climate. And this is roughly what some of the climate models, not the more extreme ones, will project that is going to happen over here in the next 100 years. And so uh, this part here is kind of a check on the model. You see what happens is aspen comes in early like it does after a fire, and then spruce comes in and some maple and birch, and the, the sort of width of these different things indicates the relative abundance. And that's kind of the forest you get, a mixture of spruce, maple, birch with some aspen. That's what you see on these clay moraines. Um, start warming, and what happens is spruce drops out, becomes too warm for spruce. Maple actually starts to do pretty good, so long as it doesn't get too warm or dry. And what his maple is doing is it's kind of moving around the Great Lakes from, you see a lot more maple in Wisconsin and Michigan, and it's moving around into northern Minnesota. So its range is kind of expanding uh, northward. And the birch is switching from paper birch here to yellow birch here. So there's actually an increase in productivity with a warmer climate on clay soils so long as it doesn't get too warm or too dry. On the sands, though, uh, it gets too warm for spruce. Spruce dries, die, uh, dies out. Too droughty for maple, birch, even much of jack pine. And what you're left with is this scruffy oak pine savanna in sandy outwash. Um, and when we warm things even more, dried them down even more on the clay, the clay look like this. So much of northern Minnesota now, in the future, is going to look like that, if not all of it. <clears throat> it's already happening. This is a little bit west of, uh, here's Minnesota here, but it's on the boreal forest prairie border. And back in 2010 or so, this was published in 2011. Here's the, the area here. Here's the boreal forest aspen parkland border. This is aspen, and it looks gray. That's not because it's in the fall after the leaves have fallen. This is taken in the summer. And these are bogs, and they're bone dry. So this drought killed massive amounts of aspen over a very large segment of the the prairie boreal forest border just to the northwest of us in Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan in Alberta. So it's, it's already happening. Um, Lee Frelick is finding, I don't know how many of you know Lee Frelick, but he works, he's a forest ecologist in the forestry department here. Lee and I were graduate students together. Lee is finding in measuring tree growth in the boundary waters that spruce and fir, the growth is declining exactly like our model predicted. And we published that back in 1988. And the growth of maple is increasing. So it's already happening. It's, it's not a theory. It's happening. And I have to thank Lee for these slides. What's really important here is here, here's the North Woods that we all know and love, right? Imagine yourself in a canoe down here. And here are the maples and the pines and spruces and stuff. This is the North Woods we all love. Here's that jack pine savanna, maybe a little uh, oak and oak, oak jack pine savanna that it's going to. Well, you know, in some ways, that's an interesting ecosystem. It's good deer habitat. It's good grouse habitat. Great turkey habitat. You know, nothing wrong with that. Um, but here's what it's going to look like in between. It's going to take a long time to get rid of this and rebuild this. In the meantime, this is what it's going to look like. Okay, It's going to be a very messy transition. As fires sweep along the landscape, trees die. And they die. It's going to take a while for the oaks and jack pine and everything else to get in there and start growing again. You don't get a 100-year-old tree overnight. It takes 100 years to get a 100-year-old tree. So for the next several generations of people, this is what we might be seeing in northern Minnesota. So I'm going to close with a few readings here. And people often ask me, so what does this mean for the economy of northern Minnesota? And you know, well, we're not going to have a timber economy, probably not going to have a, much of a tourist economy for a while. But you know what? We'll figure out a way to make 
a living in northern Minnesota. We'll have some kind of economy in northern Minnesota. It won't be the economy we have, but we'll, we'll figure it out. What's really important to me is what it means for how we see ourselves as a people. And so much of how we define ourselves as a people depends on the natural history of the landscapes we live in and the organisms we live with. Arizonans are the people of the Sonoran Desert. Minnesotans are the people of big pines, wolves, moose, and the whales of loons. Vermonters are the people of sugar maples and maple syrup. Who will we be if we lose the landscapes and organisms that define us? What will our grandchildren and great-grandchildren think of when they learn that by burning fossil fuels, we deprive them of the opportunity to also be the people of white pine, moose, and loons, even though we knew what the consequences would be. We know this. To preserve the North Woods for the future, it will not be enough to simply set aside large chunks of preserves, such as the boundary waters, valuable as these continue to be. We will need to preserve the climate of the entire planet. If we do not, new assemblages of species will form, and the Northwoods as an intact ecosystem will probably almost, if not entirely, disappear. We are on the cusp of whether to try to stop the worst of this. We are now responsible for the future of the Northwoods. So how do we exercise that responsibility? And many of us in this audience have gray hair, including me. So you all remember that song, Teach Your Children Well? Crosby, Stills, and Nash, right? We could have a sing-along afterwards. <clears throat> okay. As we become more urban, many people, especially children, are becoming increasingly estranged from nature. Yet natural history underlies many of today's policy and legislative issues, including global warming. Natural history is the underpinning to conservation, to natural resource management, and to human health and food supply. Oh, I forgot to... So this is what we're going to lose, and these are the people that are going to lose it. My grandson and my granddaughter, and your grandchildren. We have learned precious little about the natural history of most organisms other than those we can harvest for money, even in biomes as well studied as the North Woods. Much, if not most, of what we know about the non-harvestable flora and non-game wildlife I hate those terms, non-game wildlife. I just, I hate that. But that's the official DNR term. Uh, it's not a criticism of DNR. It's just say we got to figure out a different term here. Much of the not what we know about the non-game wildlife of any biome is the paragraph on the organism in a field guide. But how the Northwoods or any other biome will respond to climate change, timber harvesting, hunting, or invasion by exotic species depends on the details of the natural history of the organisms. A fascination with how the world works is an important part of what it means to be a human being. If we lose that fascination, we become less human. Our decisions on how we care for the Earth will be enhanced if we renew this basic human trait. And I'd like to interpose here a shout out to the Bell Museum and all natural history museums. This is what they're trying to do. <clears throat> As one of my favorite authors, Robert Michael Pyle, has said, what we know we may choose to care for, what we fail to recognize, we certainly won't. I firmly believe that if people could know what beautiful living, working systems, lakes, rivers, prairies, wetlands, beaches, and forests are, they would do everything they could to preserve them. Causing the extinction of a species or the demise of an ecosystem would seem a crime equal to the defacing of the Mona Lisa or the Pieta. I hope this lecture tonight helps you understand that. And I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> in, in, including questions about my grandchildren, if you have questions about my grandchildren. I have a microphone over here, so I'll come around to get questions. Okay, the Boundary Waters has had a couple major fires, such as the Bogomi Creek fire. Right. Do you anticipate that the we'll start seeing more transitional as that regrows, or will it still be more the old growth? Fi um, well, biome? you know, the interesting thing about the Boundary Waters and fires, and 
there's another essay in here that I considered reading some from tonight, too. Bud Heinzelman, who is also here at the University of Minnesota in the, the uh, Forest Service, he did a lot of his research in the 1960s on the fire history of the Boundary Waters. And what he discovered was every stand in the Boundary Waters originated from a fire. And again, depending on the soil type, that determined how hot the fire was, and that determined what kind of forest would come after that. So white pine and red pine kinds of forests, the big white pines, that had a certain fire regime, actually a very complicated one, of a crown fire every 200 years and ground fires every 50 or 60 years. Jack pine was just pure fire every 50 or 60 years. And so what Bud found from the boundary waters was that fire was not something that happened from the outside to it. It was an important part of it that created, helped to create a lot of the diversity. Um, the uh, Pagami Creek fire, Bud never saw one of the really big fires that he mapped. There, during the Civil War, a third of the boundary waters burned. And he determined this from tree rings and looking at charred tree rings and mapping these trees all over the boundary waters by canoe. And so these fires were huge in pre-settlement times. And Bud always wanted to see one of these big fires, but he died before he could. The Pagami Creek fire was exactly like that. And it's too bad Bud didn't live to see that. And uh, one of the classes I teach, I give some lectures on forest fires. And I thought, you know, so let me look at when, the, from Bud's maps, when the last time that area burned, and it was 160 years ago, and that fire arrived right on time, what Bud would say, that forest needs to, it's, it's due to be burnt. And if you go into the Pagami Creek area, it's regenerating exactly like Bud said it will. Now, that'll continue to happen until we get a little bit warmer. We're on the edge of... Um, if a forest burns in the boundary waters, whether or not it'll come back to uh, a forest or not, because it'll just get too hot and dry in that burned area. So we're maybe a few decades off from that, but certainly, certainly within the lifetime of these two kids. If, if we keep going the way we're going, um, these kids, when they're my age, the Northwoods, and you know, we'll all be dead, but the Northwoods will be gone by the time they get to be our age, okay? Now, fortunately, my son, way in the back row, is already taking them into the Boundary Waters. Laszlo, a uh, little boy on the right there, has been in, into the Boundary Waters several times. So we're trying to introduce these kids to the North Woods, if nothing else, that you know, maybe when they get to be teenagers, we'll say, you know, we hope we taught our children well, and you guys got to storm the barricades now and save this stuff. Um, but yeah, fire, it's, it's important. It's important in maintaining the Northwoods and it's going to be an important part of the transition of the Northwoods to whatever comes after that. And if you're interested in that particular topic, you mentioned Lee Freilich. Um, several of you would have been here, but probably three years ago now, Lee was one of our speakers. So it's a good time to mention that we have an, a podcast archive on University of Minnesota iTunes, um, and you can go back and find uh, Lee Freilich and a number of other speakers. But he talked about fire regimes, blowdowns, and other stuff happening in the in the Boundary Waters. I'm just curious about um, your travels as you were looking at the beaver ponds. Were you in a canoe? How did you get so close to those beaver ponds? And uh, such a good chance to some of them we just slogged in. You you just learned to get wet. You'd learn to get wet <clears throat> if you're working in beaver ponds. Some of them we, we dragged a canoe in and sort of stashed a canoe in the, the really big ones. So that, that one uh, pond with the dam, we just had a, an old beat-up grumman stashed in the woods there that we would use. <clears throat> I was just wondering if the Thompson you were talking about is the namesake of Thompsonite. Is it the namesake of Thompsonite? I don't know. It could be, but I don't know. I, I suspect not.
because he never described Thompsonite in his journals or anything like, well, he wouldn't have said, oh, I'm going to name it after myself. <clears throat> um, I should find out, though. That's a, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I suspect not, but I'm not sure. Could be. All Any right. Any other questions? Any other questions tonight? Excellent. I just want to say I had the unique pleasure to meet John over coffee um, and a muffin up in Duluth uh, about a month ago. Um, and it was just such a pleasure. And it just reminds me to acknowledge with everybody else the great generosity of the speakers that we have here. I mean, he, you know, he came down with his wife for uh, to do this talk tonight. We don't pay our speakers. They come to do this to share their knowledge and their research and their passion with you. So thank you so much, John. Thanks for thank being you. here. And thank you all for coming, and we'll see you December 20th for our next cafe.